Good evening and welcome. Um, I'm Jonathan Rison, Director of the Social Brain Centre here at the RSA, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event. Um, before we begin, could I ask you to make sure your phones are off? Uh, if they're not, if they are on, you can you can tweet if they're done if that's done silently. Um, but certainly, we shouldn't be having any noise or buzzing or ringing. Um, the this event is being live streamed and recorded, and it will be available for download at the RSA website in a few days' time. Um, now, official notices are over. Um, apart from to tell you that hash RSA Gardener is the Twitter hashtag, and uh, there should be plenty of activity there from people here and watching online. Now, um, Professor Gardner is widely regarded as one of the world's leading public thinkers. He's the father of the influential theory of multiple intelligences. He is the professor of um, cognition and education at Harvard Graduate School of Education. And he's a senior director of the educational research group, Harvard Project Zero. And Professor Gardner joins us this evening to share his latest thinking from a new book co-authored with Katie Davis called The App Generation. Uh, in this book and in this talk this evening, Professor Gardner draws upon a unique body of new research to explore the particular challenges facing young people today as they navigate three vital areas of adolescent life, identity, intimacy, and imagination in the digital world. Now, I just want to say something personal. I, I um, studied at Harvard about 10 years ago and was very lucky to take part in a course that Harvard was teaching for about a year called Cognition, Education, and Developing Brain. And I wanted to share two things about Howard that you won't see in the bios. Um, one is that he is uh, an email responder par excellence. Like he, you can be sure if you write him an email that you will get a response. It may be short, but it's invariably helpful. And I wouldn't encourage you to flood his inbox tomorrow. But I think in this, in this day and age, it's actually a particularly valuable quality that you will get some feedback. Um, and the second thing is he's an extraordinary teacher, um, both sort of 100% exacting really demanding a lot from his students, but also 100% encouraging, really very, very supportive. Um, so to be around him was always a very pleasant experience, and, and uh, you know, I think back to that time with a lot of fond memories, and I'm very glad to have kept in touch with him since then. That's my personal bit over. Without further ado, Professor Gardner. Thanks, Jonathan, and good evening. It's a great pleasure to be back at the Royal Society of the Arts, and to talk with you about this new book, which despite the forbidden of bringing it to the United Kingdom, we succeeded in doing so. So uh, it exists, and I, get, I gather there are some, actually some extra copies here. Um, can you all hear me? And you can all see the slides. So I think we're, we're in business. Um, this is the, the cover of the new book, and my plan is to give you a feeling for the phenomena by reading you the beginning of the book, then give you some background, both intellectual and methodological, about what led to the app generation, then discuss the three eyes, with Jonathan mentioned, identity, intimacy, and imagination, then introduce what I think may turn out to be the most um, meme-like aspect of the book, what it means to be app-dependent and what it means to be app-enabled, and then I will begin with a familial conclusion. The question that we posed six years ago was in what ways might young people actually be different than preceding generations as a result of their being completely immersed in the digital world? And there was a very crystallizing conversation for me a couple years ago when I brought together my co-author, Katie Davis, who was in her early 30s, and her sister, Molly, who was clearly um, a complete digital native, and myself, who you can tell by looking at me as a complete digital immigrant. And here's the pictures of the three of us. And we had a conversation in which Molly, then age 16, had noticed something in her school. She noticed that some of the senior girls who were dating senior boys, these would be 16, 17 years old, had started to show up on her Facebook news feed as being quote unquote married. Only they were married not to their actual boyfriends, but to the freshman boys who played on the same sports team. Molly explained, 
The popular senior girls pick out a freshman guy who is cute and popular and probably going to be really attractive when he's older. They'll kind of adopt him, then take pictures with him, write on his wall and flirt with him in a joking sort of way. The boys are kind of like their puppets. Howard, I, was surprised by this practice, noting that we typically think of girls in high school and college as being on the lookout for older men. I said, when I went to school, the junior and senior girls all were trying to go out with college guys. So what does this have to do with the book? What, Christ, what this conversation crystallized for me was that the way young people today think about identity may be quite different from the way that I and my colleagues did uh, many years ago. Their notion of intimate relationships may also be quite uh, exotic. And finally, their imaginations may be bizarre. And uh, it turns out these all begin with the letter I. So we had a subtitle. <laughs> And uh, it took a while for the title of the book to crystallize. What do we use to arrive at the conclusion that this generation is well described as the app generation? We talked with many, many teachers and other people who had known young people for at least a 20 year period. So these were people who had begun to teach or to be religious leaders or camp counselors or we talked both to mental health workers and to psychoanalysts, and we said to them, in which ways have young people changed? We never asked how were they changed by digital media, but I don't think we had a single conversation where somebody didn't mention computers or pads or smartphones. Um, we carried out separate focus groups with these um, various categories of workers. Um, we took a look at both literary works and graphic productions by young people. Blind scoring doesn't mean we had lenses over our eyes, but rather the, the coders did not know whether these had been done 20 years ago, around 1990, or just a few years ago, 2010. We also had conversations with many young people, and with permission, I actually eavesdropped on some conversations where I wasn't really invited. And if, if you want to ask me later about uh, what happened in those eavesdropping conversations, I'll mention it if it doesn't come up before. So those were the, um, the, the data sources on which we relied. But there were also um, some books which were, by coincidence, both published in 1950, over a half century ago, which not only described the period of my youth, roughly, but also were books which both in the American context, but I think also in, in other um, developed countries, um, told us something about what it was like to grow up in mid-century. Um, so David Reisman, who was a well-known sociologist, claimed that in the 18th century in the United States, people were tradition directed. They tried to do what their forebears had done in the country of their origin, or if they'd come on the Mayflower, what they had done um, in the 17th century. In the 19th century, they became much more interdirected. That means that they um, tried to decide what it is that they wanted to achieve. They reflected on their own goals, strengths, and weaknesses, and they weren't that much affected by tradition, nor were they that much affected by what their peers were doing. But the mid 20th century, the period of mass society, which was written about in many European and American uh, nations, was a time when people were very aware of what the neighbors were doing, keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak. And Reisman and his colleagues claimed that at that time, um, other directedness was the best label. And I think probably those of you who remember the book vaguely will know that's what the book was so influential, because this seemed to be a new phenomenon. We are proposing that 50 years later, our time, a good way to describe people, particularly young people, is to say that they're app-directed. And if you are one of the few people here who don't know what apps are, I will try to explain them presently. So that's David Reisman, who was a sociologist. And he was trying to describe uh, society as it had changed over 
the centuries. Um, my own tutor was a well-known psychoanalyst named Eric Erickson, um, and he wrote about life stages. If you remember, if you ever took a psychology course, he talked about eight life stages, each of which had a crisis of one sort or another. Because of the age that we're writing about in this book, um, we're concerned with the crisis of adolescence, where if adolescence goes well, you have a solid identity which has meaning for you and for other people. You have an identity crisis, but it gets resolved in a favorable way. But if it doesn't, you end up having role diffusion. You try to be too many people to too many different audiences, or a negative identity where you do the opposite, certainly of what your family wants, and that's not a good thing. Um, the crisis, the node of young adulthood, is are you capable of intimate relationships? Do you have a significant others? Do you fall in love? Do you get married? Um, and then midlife, what is called generativity versus stagnation, but to maintain the three eyes, we convert it into imagination. Generativity means both do you um, pass on your genes, I guess the word generativity has that, but also do you contribute to your society, do you do something new, do you make the world different than it was before? So um, this, in the back of my mind, were the comparisons I was making, but of course for Katie and Molly, these were not things that were nearly so vivid. So, at last, what are apps? Apps are applications which carry out discrete tasks, like if at the hotel where I was at this morning, I didn't know how to come here, I would have just typed it in and it would be error free. I could do it by bus, by walking, by, uh, to, by um, the tube, whatever way I wanted. Um, they're quick, they're on demand. You don't have to spend a lot of time futzing around. You um, activate the app and it uh, does what it's supposed to. Um, it provides shortcuts. It could even provide a navigational shortcut if I didn't like the initial route. Um, and they're highly structured. Um, there's not a lot of room for deviation in the prototypical app. And that's especially true of Apple makes the app because Apple doesn't want you to, to get lost. So it, uh, it's very tightly structured apps. And this was pointed out nicely by Katie. Um, if you take a look at your smart device, most of you will have a um, home page, so to speak, like this. And not only do these apps have names, you know, weather, um, clock, uh, um, safari, whatever, but these are very done in a very much of an advertisement kind of way. The icon is very vivid, and it, it defines exactly what it is. And when you begin to create a Facebook or LinkedIn portrait of yourself, uh, if you follow that model, you want the image to be very brand-like, to give a lot of information of the sort that you want people to have. So why did we decide to call young people today in the United States, but I have a feeling it's not going to be just restricted to the United States, the app generation. First of all, for just about anything that you can think of, there is an app. So you can go throughout your life garlanded with apps. You can spend a lot of time activating and following the procedures in apps. And then we developed a notion called the super app. Now, I have to say that the super app is probably, at present, mostly a characterization of the kinds of young people whom we did most of our interviews with, which would be middle class, upper middle class young people who are likely to go to um, university. And the super app is a term which we coined to describe how life is a series of apps culminating in the super app. So first you have to go to the right um, elementary school. Jonathan was just telling me that uh, 
the, that his child is just starting school and is going to the right school, the good school, and he's like a good parent going to the parent organization tonight. That's what you should do. And then you have to go to the right secondary school. In the United States, you have to have um, the right courses and um, the right help in taking the high stake tests. Then you have to go to the right college. And in college, you probably should major in economics or business. And you should have an internship during the summer, if possible, at Morgan Stanley or McKinsey. Um, and then, of course, you should try to go to them right afterwards, unless you go for Teach for America. Is that Teach for All here? Is that what it's called? Uh, teach First. Because that actually looks good on your resume if you've done a couple of years before you go to investment banking or the city here. Now, um, obviously, this is slightly tongue in cheek, but maybe less tongue in cheek than you might think for many, many people who go to the, uh, um, the elite schools in the United States. But you have to realize that most people are not going to be successful in their super app. They're not going to be able to follow that stream. They're going to run into problems. And to me, perhaps other than that conversation with Molly and Katie, the most stunning thing that, it, that I found out in research is most young people today have never gotten lost. They have never gotten lost because either they've got something on that can find them or their parents have something that can find them. And of course, for those of you of a certain age, you have gotten lost and you know what? You get found again and nobody gets per lost permanently. But if you've never been lost geographically, topographically, um, you may be not prepared to get lost in other ways. And to me, this is a, uh, fairly frightening because what happens if there is no app? Or as we say, if there's a hurricane or a cyber attack, uh, if you've never found your way before, that's not good. So what I want to do now is to give you a few findings from each of the three eyes and then talk a bit more about uh, app dependence and app enablement. First of all, identity. Uh, I don't know who this is. <laughs> Actually, I didn't know who this was till I watched the middle of the Super Bowl, but Beyonce is a very well-known uh, performer, singer, uh, married to a rap star, um, and she has got a very strong identity. Um, and this makes an impact because ever since we've had stars of a Hollywood sort or a Bollywood sort, these become uh, figures that young people identify with. So there's great pressure to be, have a polished self. You've got to look really good. Of course, since many of us don't feel quite so good as we look, and we look at everybody else who looks so polished, that can be intimidating. The self is also packaged. You have to be able to communicate not just how you look, but what kinds of activities you have, what kinds of friends you have, how much you are liked, how much you are tweeted. Um, and again, that limits um, the degrees of freedom for your identity. This is, was another thing that was extremely surprising to me. In, we did over 100 interviews with adults who'd seen young people for decades. And I think the single most frequent characterization were that these young people were risk averse. And whenever you do research, it's the stuff that surprises you that you find most interesting. And I'd never really thought, even though I have you know, four children and my grandchildren are too young, that risk aversion would be a recurring theme. But whether these were counselors at camps where the kids put on activities, where these were schools where kids did essays and uh, put on plays or things like that, whether these were psychoanalytic se sessions where young people spoke about their angst, the aversion to risk came through over and over again. And then I thought about my own teaching, and I don't want to hold myself up as a complete prototype, but when I went to school back in the Paleolithic era, when we were given assignments, it was kind of fun to figure out what was wanted. And nowadays, how many pages, what size, what font, exactly what do you want to have, and furor if, God forbid, you should deviate from that when you're actually looking at the exam. So even though I hadn't thought about it in this terms, I've seen this um, myself. Now, you're probably thinking, to what extent is this connected to the digital world? And that would be a good thing to discuss, because, of course, we can't prove it. But 
the notion that young people were risk averse was very powerful to me. And if you think about apps and you know, laying everything out precisely, then um, you don't want to deviate because uh, you know, then you could fall off the, uh, the screen. And these are words which people use. There's an awful lot of young people looking at other young people, both ones they know and ones they don't know, and doing comparisons. Um, I think, and, and feeling inadequate if the other people looked more polished, more packaged, and so on. Um, the surprise to all of us in the field, and especially to Sherry Turkle, who I will mention soon, who I think has written the most powerful book about the digital era. In fact, more than one, Life on a Screen and Alone Together, you may know these books, was the change between before social media and the onset of social media. Before social media, Sherry Turkle speculated that there would be a lot of identity play, trying out new things, lots of anonymity, um, um, lots of role experimentation. But once social media, Facebook, uh, Netscape, whatever um, the particular uh, social network emerged, that experimentation was radically cut down because you had presented yourself in a certain way and you were pretty much stuck in doing that again. Intimacy. I'm not going to give a lecture on love or intimacy, but the prototype when Erickson wrote about it was that you would have deep, significant relationships with a few people, um, what's called um, a few strong ties, lots of many, many weak ties, um, and this would enable you to have a, 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 um, a, a lifetime partner, though obviously that was not always uh, honored. Um, and I guess my thing where I was amused uh, and bemused was the first time I heard about a couple of kids who hooked up, then went to Facebook to read about them, and then decided whether or not they ever wanted to see the person again, uh, kind of a perhaps reverse of the way that things had happened some time ago. Anyway, young people today are always connected. Um, you know, the notion of looking up rather than looking down is becoming a, a vanishing goal. Um, reluctance to be vulnerable. Um, this is the Sherry Turkle book that I was mention, mentioning. Difficulty with eye contact. Um, again, one of the things which has been written about and which uh, surprised me was the tendency now when a couple breaks up is not to do it face to face, having those difficult conversations, but rather to do it by texting. And in my 24 hours in London so far, I've seen three plays and plays would be very boring if they didn't have these difficult conversations if it was all taking place on text. I guess you'd have to put it on the screen. You know, a lot of drama and you know, a lot of life is having difficult conversations, but texting and not looking at people's eyes, it's a very different kind of intimacy or maybe not an intimacy at all. And there's a lot of speculation in the literature on the digital world about whether empathy is more difficult to establish now. Because empathy, so the argument goes, involves in getting to know somebody well, being able to put yourself in their skin, getting to see what they, how they feel, looking at their reactions and so on. And if so much of your conversation, quote unquote, occurs through written messages, um, the extent to which you can put, somebody, put yourself into somebody's place is diminished. And in fact, this morning I was reading another book that's coming out of our research group by, um, by Carrie James, um, in which she discusses um, intellectual property, privacy, and participation. And one of the, one of the things which she, she reports is people say, well, it's just the net. Or if they're playing a multi-user game, it's just a game. And these are a way of distancing yourself from the meaning of what it is to cyber bully or to threaten or do something else online rather than face to face where you can see the person's 
reactions. So, um, on imagination, I'm going to take a show of hands. Um, you have only two choices. How many of you think imagination has flowered during the digital era? And how many of you think imagination has become uh, diminished? So and you all have to vote. How many of you think it's become uh, greater? Raise your hand, please. OK, 36%. Uh, how many of you think it's become less? OK, what's 36 from 100? 64. This is for the audience who's, uh, who, who's listening to this, watching this online. Uh, my, I would say it was about 2 to 1, maybe uh, two, and a, uh, 2 and a half to 1. Anyway, um, we found a, a complicated picture when it, come to, when it came to um, imaginative powers. What we did was we looked at um, teen publications over a 20-year period, and we, we compared both the literary creations and the graphic creations of young people 20 years ago and young people today. And this was social science, so we developed a quite elaborate coding system and we got reliability, meaning two coders would agree on various dimensions. We had 18 coding categories and we looked at um, 350 different works. So it's a lot easier to talk through this slide than to do it. It took a team of people some time to do the coding. What we found when it came to graphic arts, I'll keep, I won't mystify it, is um, the later works were much more fully rendered. Um, there were fewer blank spaces and much more um, detail um, filling on the canvas, can the canvas or the paper with much more um, fine points. Um, you can see here um, when we compared the early and the late group that um, there was much more blank space among the younger people, um, much more fully rendered space among the uh, younger people 20 years later. Um, and even though one could quarrel about whether this is more imagination, suffice it to say that we were impressed in, in looking at these 18 categories in a whole bunch of different media at um, how, how much more resourceful in using of different techniques um, we found in the more recent works than in the ones from 20 years ago. Now, of course, you could say, um, well, these were enabled by the greater palette that is available in many um, either computer applications or simply um, <laughs> pastiches, mosaics, uh, um, mixing of media that's possible. But the, the point is that that was the finding with regard to the graphic arts. When it came to writing, our coding showed a very different picture. Um, we found among older, I keep saying older, we found among the 16-year-olds in 2010, as opposed to the 16-year-olds in uh, 1990, less play with genre, you know, going from fiction to nonfiction, from mystery to um, uh, science fiction and so on. The plots were more mundane, maybe risk aversion here. The story was much more linear, first this, then this, then this. And um, language was less formal. Again, this may well be due to a life of texting, or a half-life of texting. Um, more slang and abbreviations and things like that. So, um, summarizing a massive amount of data in a, in a Twitter-length conclusion, what we found is, if we think in terms of imagination as coded by people who don't know who produced the work, the graphic works do well, the literary works do less well. Here's an example of a short beginning from a 1990 story. As I step into his office, Sanborn scuttles sideways out from under his mahogany desk to greet me, as usual. His blue shell, encrusted with tiny jewels, sparkles, and his fragile feelers begin tracing an invisible diagnosis in the air. Call the psychiatrist. 
a story from 2010, didn't have a name. This is the first year of your adulthood that you will not have spent working. Your wife wakes you up next to you at six in the morning, seven days a week. Your daughter and son no longer call daily, but rather you receive a text message every other day on a phone with a touch screen that you're not sure how to end a call on. Sorry for the misspelling under mot, mo, not. Um, and obviously these, these examples are vivid, um, but th they were reflected in the coding that we did. So what I've tried to convey so far is that whether you're talking about identity and um, the degree of packagedness and getting it into good shape quickly, intimacy where there seems to be a favoring of the superficial and an anxiety about having difficult relationships face to face, or um, imagination where, as the slide said, Marshall McLuhan is right. It depends whether you look at the graphic medium, which looks good in a 20-year comparison, or the literary medium, which looks rather banal. In all of these three areas, we found significant differences. And of course, in the book, we try to connect this as we can to the um, hegemony of digital media. So the, as we move toward what does this all mean and what do we do about it, I want to introduce a distinction which um, we felt very powerful. Apps are here to stay. I can't think of any scenario in which apps are suddenly going to disappear. But the question is, as you begin to work with apps, do you become dependent on them? And does that restrict your, um, your breadth of vision, your sense of whom you can be, the way you relate to people? Um, or do you become dependent on the apps, in which case um, your, your imagination and identity and intimacy are really restricted um, and undermined. There's also a third possibility, uh, app transcendence. Uh, somehow, uh, I don't think Leonardo da Vinci was ever uh, limited by an app. But uh, I've also thought about Steve Jobs, about whom we know a great deal nowadays. Uh, Steve Jobs is probably as uh, responsible as anybody for apps, and yet uh, he doesn't seem to be somebody who was particularly dependent or even enabled by apps. He transcended them in his own imagination. But I want to use um, a first tell you about an experiment which was done in psychology and then give you uh, an example of app dependence versus app enablement. This is um, courtesy of a, of a young psychologist in America named Elizabeth Bonowitz. And when I read this experiment, I said, even though it doesn't involve digital media, it really captures the sense of dependence versus enabling. What happens is that um, you have an experimenter here on the right, and she, she introduces a toy to the four-year-old child on the left. And there are two contrasting conditions. In a complete demonstration, <coughs> What happens is that you're given this device, and the experimenter shows you exactly what to do if you want to make music, if you want to squeak, if you want to have a mirror, or you want it to light up. So we call this uh, a completely didactic uh, um, um, pedagogically centered way of conveying information. In the other condition, um, what happens is the experimenter spends the same amount of time with the child. But instead of explaining what each one is, she is a klutz. And she bumps into something, and it makes a noise. She says, oh, that's interesting. And then she twists one other thing. And then she says, I have to go. But she talks about the same amount of time, about uh, 45 seconds. And then she says, call me when you're done. And the child is left with this toy for as long as the child wants. I bet if I ask you, under what condition does the child play longer with the toy, you'd all get the right answer. Uh, and when I read this experiment, I said to myself, this is a pre-digital um, or non-digital catalyzation of the difference between an app, which actually gets you to try out new things and frees you, so to speak, 
as opposed to one which lays out to what to do in such a constraining fashion that once you do it, that's it. And here you can see pictures of a child trying out for herself the various things that the app is doing. So what I want to do now is to talk about the graphic realm and make a contrast of things which are app dependent or app enabled. And these were not sold in this way, but it's an uh, interpretation that uh, Katie and I made. There is an um, app called Doodle Buddy, and Doodle Buddy allows you to doodle and to draw things. So this is the uh, icon for Doodle Buddy, and um, you're given various um, options at the bottom of the screen and various kinds of shapes you can make. Um, and various kinds of um, thicknesses. And, but you're free to draw the way you want. And so this is a free drawing that Victoria made um, of a tree of some sort with a sun and a ground and uh, walnuts or coconuts or something growing on it. Um, and we call this an app enablement because you don't have to you can do what you want given that palette. Um, in an app-dependent application, uh, you choose whether you want to do something easy, moderate, or hard. And then it's completely color by number. Um, this is something that certainly existed in the pre-digital era. And you just choose the color you want, and you eventually fill in everything. And it's a, um, an app with essentially very few degrees of freedom. What's interesting about Doodle Buddy is you can also use it in an app-dependent way if you make use of the shapes which exist at the beginning, in which case the same application can either be used in an enabling way or in a dependent way. And uh, this makes it essentially like color by number. And the point here, which is an important one, is whether something is dependent or enabling is to some extent in the structure of the app as produced by whoever made the app. And there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of apps that you can get on your Apple device. But it's also a choice that you make yourself about how to use it. And when it is with young people, as in the Bonowitz study, it's a choice of the people who interact with you, how they model it and what they encourage you to do. So dependence and enablement is options which cut across a number of different constituencies. Um, I think you know this man, David Hockney, and he, of course, uses his pad, and I assume that he does it in an enabling rather than the, in a dependent way. So I want to conclude um, with a conversation that I had with my grandson, Oscar. He's now seven, um, but um, when we had the conversation, he was six, six years old. Um, uh, he calls me Opa, and Opa says to Oscar, um, I said, what, if, you, if I take away your iPhone, he said, I wouldn't be sad, I still have a computer. Oh, what's it like? Bigger than my mom's. You can see Oedipus here. <laughs> what do you do on it? Search on toys, go to dot com, do something like herofactory.com, little things. I can write a little code into the line so I can play some sort of game. And I'm kind of shocked by his facility with this language. Um, Oscar says, I Google everything. Amazon, like anything I need to go to Google or write it down. You sound a bit exasperated, Oscar. Kind of, but I'm not sure what I know what exasperated means. <laughs> <laughs> he knows about Google and code and so on. So Howard says, I grew up without computers. What do you think that was like? Oscar, people would do all chores and more chores and more chores and no fun. No fun? A little bit, but not much fun. Do you use computers for school and study? Oscar, he said six. I really don't do these things. I just use my computers for fun. How do, you use your, how do your mom and dad use computers? For only one thing, work. My mom downloads things she has to do, like does work about food in my school. He, he, she's studying uh, food science in graduate school. So I want to. Um, I decide, it says here, Howard decides to put, push Oscar a bit on what digital media did and did not mean to him 
and what they enabled or prevented. And this conversation, with which I'm going to conclude, was very illuminating to me about how Oscar sees the world. I say, how do you feel when your parents say, put it away? Oscar, feel a little blue, a little blue. How would you feel, I say, if your parents took all your computers and phones away for a few weeks? Oscar, I feel a little blue, but I could actually have more freedom. Play with toys, play with Aggie, his then eight-month-old sister, go to places with mom and dad. I say, what do you mean by freedom? Oscar says, mostly people have technology. This is his word. They're watching every game and it makes a boring sound. Do it all day and don't do anything else but just watch TV. So you can play with toys and things like that. And I'll end with this image of Oscar in a pre-digital vein. Thank you. Thank you very much, Howard. I'm going to ask two questions and then open it up to everyone else. Um, I think the main thing I want to ask is you, you drew this binary towards the end about uh, app enablement and app dependence, but you didn't use the word addiction. And I think um, there are some people out there who are nervous about the forms of immediate feedback, you know, reliable stimulus that, that these forms of technology give us, such that um, it's not so much whether we, how we use them, how we choose to use them, but the fact that they begin to take ownership of our life. We, we go to sleep with them, uh, we uh, sort of use them for virtually everything, we sometimes find ourselves in, in bathrooms checking them and so forth, and it just begins to feel as though they're um, dominating us. So do you feel there's a, a sort of deeper, more troubling issue to do with addiction, or do you feel this is something that we can get control of and learn to use properly? Well, I was... Um thinking just in the last 24 hours about how fortunate I am to have been born in a pre-digital era because I use apps and uh, you know, platforms all the time but I really and I hope I'm not fooling myself have a sense that I maintain agency and if you told me I would have to put it away I'd have to go back to the library again but it wouldn't change my life um, but I do think that especially if parents are themselves absorbed all the time, and as you and I were talking earlier, um, I think I actually may have a picture here of, uh, yes, of, of uh, um, Aggie uh, already with her smart device. I guess it's off on the big screen, so uh, maybe we can, we can move, move it ahead. Uh, yes, uh, if, if we raise kids like this, then how could it possibly be any different unless there's a big meltdown, in which case one has to be educated. So yeah, I, I, worry, I worry about that. But I do think that we shouldn't absolve parents and teachers and other role models of responsibility of what it means to use it and what it means to put it away. OK. And um, I have your permission to say this, but you celebrated your 70th birthday recently. I'm glad um, you said recently. Yeah. yeah. And um, you have a wonderful body of work. Um, we know that this book is really literally quite sizzling hot off the press. I mean, it's just, just come, come away. But it, it comes after work on multiple intelligences, good work, and a whole range of other bodies of work. I just wondered um, what it was about this subject that, that sort of attracted you the most, and also how it links to your, your prior body of work. As I say in, in the forward to the book, um, a person whom I know named Judy Diamond actually asked me this question uh, several years ago. I'd already begun to do work on digital media. Um, and if you go to the goodproject.org and look at Good Play, there's a large body of work on that topic. But that work, as you may know, is mostly on the ethics of the new digital media. Um, once uh, Judy Diamond posed this question to Katie and me, we then said, well, how can we get data on this which isn't just attitudinal, because there are plenty of attitudinal books. And I think the combination of interviewing people for a 20-year period without telling that's what it was, getting access to these works, and then the eavesdropping, which I said that I would uh, uh, mention, uh, I think gave us a, 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 a new body of, of data, um, just to demystify it. Um, I go to certain family events where there are 
groups of kids who are teenagers who get together, and I sometimes ask if I can sit in. And these are not just my own family, but you know, groups of 12 or 14 kids. And what I've seen more than once is somebody asks about the use of the digital media, and kids give you a sanitized version. And then somebody talks about how some bullying occurs, and the floodgates open. And it's like there's a whole Freudian repressed that, that, uh, that comes out. The new work, which I've just started, and nobody here would know about it, is on how to reinvent the liberal arts and sciences in the 21st century. Liberal arts and sciences is how we describe what goes on in colleges and universities, U uniquely in the United States for many years. I, think, I would think an Oxbridge PPE kind of education would be the closest. And I'm trying to understand with other people to what extent digital education is going to change what we study and how we study it. Great. Okay. Now, we have mics in the room. Um, we have illicit books in the room, as I've mentioned, books that really ought not to be here because they're so new. And for that reason, we might be slightly illicit with the timekeeping. We're going to finish just after 7. Um, now, we have a Twitter person from RSA. Is that you, Joe? Great. Joe, do you have anything from coming in from Twitter, which is quite apt, if not apt, <laughs> for now? Yeah, just, just one question from Greta Hughes. Sorry, Joe, just wait one second. I'll just wait for the... Uh, uh, just one question from Greta Hewson. What do you think the implications of these issues are for this generation as they reach adulthood? By this generation, I assume that the, the, this is what you can't do in, in, in well, I guess you can, you can tweet back. Um, well, I think I said at the beginning that any young person who thinks his or her life is going to be a super app is going to be in for a very, very big shock. And there's a lot of um, work now on extended adolescence, extended early adulthood, because uh, the, at, at a certain point, the app train, may not, you may not be on it anymore. And that, I think, will require more than a little rethinking about, about life and life's, life's choices. In a way, that may be good, because it will keep you from being completely app dependent, unless you just want to play games all day, which would not be a good idea if you want to uh, Live a life. Get married and have a family and have a productive work. Okay, there's quite a lot of hands already. I'm going to ask first of all, Ian McGilchrist has a question. I know this will be of great interest to him. So. Thank you very much, Howard, and uh, I, I'm a great admirer of your work. And, and this book sounds fascinating, and I'm going to get a copy right away. Um, I was very struck by your remark about the less completed or uh, more partial rendering of pictures in the older days. And it struck me that you were you were making the, the relationship between creativity and perhaps the more fulfilled pictures. And I was thinking it might be the other way around, that it was to do with things that are implicit, that are only partially suggested, that actually engage the imagination. And that it wasn't really a, a, a contrast between the graphic and the literary. Um, it, it might be, for example, that actually, I think there is evidence of this, that children don't sustain attention so well over long periods that's required for reading, whereas images come very quickly. And images are also much more technologically um, aided than the writing of a story. So I think one, it's, it's a coherent picture and, and rather links in with the idea that nowadays, uh, just very briefly, but it seems important, that we're becoming more autistic. Uh, eye contact's more difficult, empathy is more difficult, um, and, and so on. I mean, there's a lot to say, but. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good point. We put a value judgment on the early and late literary and graphic uh, productions, but as I said in passing, one could decide to, va to valorize the other. And maybe indeed, you know, maybe people will valorize the more mundane story more. Um, I've been asked a fair amount about what happens to creativity in general in this era, and the answer I have is that we used to have a lot of little c creativity, like if Jonathan and I handle this a bit differently than we usually would. But we also have, until now, big c creativity, people who do things which are really very revolutionary in different art and sciences. My guess in the future is we're going to have more middle c creativity. Um, and it's, that's in part for the just interesting phenomenon that you can have so many people working together on something that the notion of Einstein alone in the patent office makes much less sense. If I can just push a little bit, Ian, Ian's point about eye contact, because that struck me uh, in your slides. You also mentioned empathy challenge. I mean, these are really big claims that difficulty with eye contact, what does that mean, and how much should it be of concern for us? Well, if, I mean, if you go back to any of the early childhood 
literature, which both of you would know, this is you know, the major way over you know, millennia that uh, you know, infants and the caretakers hook with one another. I don't think that's going to disappear, but if it gets supplanted very quickly, uh, a lot of things have to be rethought. Um, and uh, what it means, to, I mean, Sherry Turkle, again, who's usually ahead of us, is writing a book about conversation and uh, what actually conversation would be like if we don't have people in our space looking at us. It's very hard for me to envision. I hope it doesn't disappear. Okay. Right, so we'll take um, a question at the back there, and then if you can give your name, please, and uh, wait for the mic. Thanks. Um, good evening. I'm Dr. Maggie Atkinson. I'm Children's Commissioner for England. Uh, you don't have a Children's Commissioner in the US. Um, my work is about children's rights and their role as citizens in the world now. Um, and one of the pieces of work that we're very um, keenly progressing is on children's seeming inability to recognize that it's not a private space, the web. And not only is it not a private space, but it can be a very manipulative and difficult space to be in. So my friends, however many thousand of them I have, are not the only people who are looking at me. And I think children, the ones who speak to us, the ones who've spoken to our researchers, find that a very difficult concept to get their heads around. They see it as intimacy, they see it as boundaried, and I'm not sure it's either. And I'm just wondering whether any of your subjects talked about that or what your thoughts are. Uh, the biggest shock to me when I began this work, not the app generation, but all the work, and I think it's quite constant with your saying, as soon as you enter the digital world, you enter a world whose temporal and spatial dimensions you cannot control. And everything we know about human cognitive development is that this is not an easy concept to have, uh, to, to, to get your head around. I still can't get my head around it. Uh, right. So, so it's not just that generation, but it's a problem of the medium, in a sense. Right. Okay. Stop, I'm sorry. But, but, but just, just, I mean, I can understand it intellectually. A six-year-old can't. Right. Adults have been worrying about what kids get up to for about 200 years now. Um, in the early 19th century, the novel was going to corrupt them to perdition. Then we went through magazines, radio, film, television, games consoles. And at each stage, somehow, um, the children survived and grew up to become adults who were going to worry about the next generation in turn. Is it possible to separate out the extent to which each successive generation just worries about what the the new generation is doing from an objective change in the characteristics of this current generation of children? Um, I will give two quick answers. Number one, I think the digital explosion revolution is as disruptive as the invention of writing and the invention of print. Neither you or I will be around, but I really believe that. And I also think the disruption in education, which I never thought would happen, has happened. And education will be totally different. So I'll stick my neck out, and I guess it is being recorded, yeah. <laughs> if we still have an RSA uh, 200 years from now. I, I think it is different, but you're right. I mean, manners are, uh, Plautus said in, in, in the Latin era, manners are always declining, and I'm sure that's a refrain that he wasn't the only one who used. Sure, but still there's the question there of whether it's a big change we have to adapt to, whether there's something more sort of normative or value-based about it, like we actually should be worried, we should actually be, somehow this is a really big threat. And that's, where that's, are you on that? Are you that, closer to the threat or are you closer to the just adapting? I'm, I, I'm pretty wishy-washy on it. Right. Uh, I mean, in reading about uh, Carrie James's new book about, about ethics, um, you know, you know, a feeling for the people beyond those whom you know would be a very good thing, yeah. and it's not impossible. And, and one of the things which, um, which we have documented is the digital world are, is correlated with much more acceptance of people who are different. Right. Um, Great. Okay. Hi, uh, Dominic Pinto. Um, I've been working in and out of uh, like the telecoms and internet industry for most of my working life, so best part of 30 years. And some of these things clearly have been um, posited both in science fiction and by people in, in the industry. But one thing that really did strike me is that it's not really about kids. You kept on going about kids, but it's not. Because my nieces, the youngest is now about 21, 22, second year of medical neuroscience. 
I think it was her mother asked her when she was about six or seven years old, did you use computers at school? And she said, of course. I mean, it, it is, it's not a modern new thing. And I think I, I sort of really challenged to say whether, well, I, I thought there were two poles. Either this is a lot of tosh or is a deep insight. It's clearly somewhere in between the two. But What's the question, please? Well, I don't think I'm hearing anything really very, very new. And really, yes, things change out there, and we change and adapt. We've been doing that as a species for many, many thousands of years. Okay, so what's and your really, big message here? What's the new, what's the new what, thing? What is a real insight here which really changes the world? What's what? Earth shattering. <laughs> to be fair, it doesn't have You're to be You're setting a red or low. Yeah, <laughs> setting the bar quite high. But low, okay, low, low th threshold. Um, well, I can answer about identity even within the life of the digital media, because 20 years ago, we thought that the digital media would encourage much more exploration of identity. And now there's a packaging of self, which um, is not only, I would say, very premature, but can result in, in suicides and, and in, uh, you know, in, 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 in uh, complete disruptions of communities. For what I was talked about to the commissioner, namely, you no longer can control whom you are communicating to and what sense they make out of it. Even the, somebody will help me with the name, the thing, it's Instagram where you, where you, where you, where you show something and in 10 seconds it disappears. In those, oh, snapshot, what's, yeah, snapshot, in 10 seconds somebody can copy, copy that. And if you don't think that's revolutionary, sir, then there's nothing that would convince you that anything is revolutionary. Ah, okay, well, that, that's a much longer conversation. Yeah. Uh, 20 years ago, computers were very different. We didn't have the internet in school, so yeah, I think, I think it, it has changed. I, just, I, I want to make an observation and um, also a question. Um, I think the scenario that the student was setting up in that story was because they're in such a multimedia world and they, they, their, their world is very graphic, they were just setting up an image and expecting the person to know what the image would be, rather than having to describe it so graphically as you would in as something you'd written 20 years ago. Um, but my, my question is really, is, is schools? Um, two things about schools. We are moved from a case where we gave stu every student a book to giving every student a computer. So we're not encouraging students to work together and collaborate and look and talk to each other in schools. And surely schools should be where they learn to collaborate and they do the, that sort of solo work outside school or some of it in okay. school. Well, yeah, but, but I think one of the positive aspects of the digital media is all sorts of comp collaboration can be done it, both in school and at home. The danger is, as occurred at Harvard last year, it also encourages cheating. Uh, and nowadays one has to install quite powerful controls to keep people from you know, handing tests in together. But I would say if we were doing pluses and minuses like some of the people in this side of the room we're pushing, I think the collaboration is a plus, even though it may make the solitary genius much less likely. Great. And the next question, please, just Hi, so I'm Raphael Heath. I'm actually an app entrepreneur. Um, I've had my own app out <laughs> on the App Store. Um, but I actually had a question just to ask. You talked about the generation which are app dependent, but have you found yourself dependent upon an app that maybe has changed your life? What's your favorite app? Or <laughs> well, I'm certainly dependent upon uh, you know, platforms like, uh, like Google or Wikipedia. Um, but as I said, if there was taken away, you know, I would just, re I would revert to other, way, other sources of information. I don't use social media, not for any deep reason, but I can't even keep up with all of Jonathan's emails, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's not true, uh, he handles them very well. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, you know, I, if, you go to, if you go to Facebook or LinkedIn, I have, a pay, I have pages, but they're empty because it would be almost deceptive for me to pretend that I, uh, I have a presence there. But there is a difference between you know, an analog creature in a digital world um, who's adapting to digital technology and digital natives who have never really known the analog world. Yeah, and that's where I mean, Ian's work is very interesting. Right. Uh, it kind of, uh, to use his metaphor, it, it diminishes the kinds of uh, synthesizing and subtle things which we don't see as being digital. Right, and that's a, you think that's, that's pretty important, right? I mean, losing that is losing a lot. Right, but if we move apps in an enabling direction, that's, Maybe we don't that's, lose it. that's to the good. Okay. I mean, that, you know, David Hockney, I don't think his, his talent is being vitiated because he has a pad. Sure, great. Uh, Next question, please. We have. Uh, and, actually, and, and just to add, Sorry, the, the notion of mixing different media 
which I didn't grow up with, is so much a part of life now, and I think that's quite, quite exciting. Sure. Just, just having seen China America, which when I, this is amazing, when I got my ticket yesterday for China America, they said, give me your email. And I said, why? They said, well, the technology sometimes sometime doesn't work and we have to contact you. Right. And it's an, you know, kind of an amazing experience. Uh, anything more, Joe, from Twitter? Yeah, one more question from... Uh, one more question from uh, Kit Huckvale, and it partly relates to the fact that your research was mainly with the more affluent young people, as I understand it. Uh, do social and financial inequalities affect how different groups are being affected by the shifts you describe? It turns out that at least in countries like the United States and Britain, everybody has these technologies. I mean, they're, they're essentially universal. Um, there are some differences in how they're used, and uh, you know, it's a difference than you know, if you have parents who have you scheduled for a whole bunch of extra, extra school activities, or if you're just at home with the television and your, your pad. But when we talked to, we did a focus group of people who work with kids who are not advantaged, and something rather humorous came out, uh, namely that kids in America don't shovel snow anymore because the wealthy families hire somebody to come in and do it, and in the poor families, um, the parents do it because the kids are cuddled both ways. So the digital divide, which many of us expected, is not showing up in not just in our work, but in almost nobody else's. Now, when you get to a country where you know, the, the, pur the purchase of a phone or a pad is prohibitive, then of course you're going to see differences. But uh, both, both in Britain and in the United States, we have been underwhelmed by differences across social, social classes. Great, okay. And we're running short of time now, so I'm gonna wrap up. Um, sorry if you didn't get a chance to ask your question. Um, I wanted to share something um, that so someone else, uh, speaking about Howard, described him as a blend of Mick Jagger and Charles V. He said, um, this was, he said he's like Mick, Howard is a rock star, but like Charles V, the sun never sets on Howard Gardner's empire of ideas. So with that in mind, I'd like to thank Howard Gardner for sharing them with us. Thank you.